Good evening and welcome to the Aspen Institute. This is the Murdoch Mind, Body, Spirit series and I am Gina Murdoch. I've always been captivated by the Aspen idea, which is the idea of nurturing the whole individual, the body, mind, and the spirit. Together with my husband, Jerry, We have established and endowed this series as a way to pay homage to the founding principles of the Aspen Institute, and in particular, the Aspen Idea. In this series, we host a diverse range of experts, innovators, and leaders on topics ranging from optimal nutrition, health, happiness, and well-being, neuroscience, habits, and behavior, spirituality, and now. A topic that one friend of mine indicated was risky for the Aspen Institute the new science of psychedelics. Tonight, we are honored to feature Michael Pollan. Michael has been on our wish list for years, thank you, Michael, for his great writing, teaching, and activism in the fields of nutrition, the American food supply, clean eating, and the topic of his groundbreaking new book, How to Change Your Mind. He has called himself an immersive journalist, writing from the inside of these topics to bring us, his readers, deep into the experiences of being alive, as he sees it, whether through food and the land, building a home, or in this case, something that he says changed him for the better, to become more open, emotionally available, less defensive, and patient. Sign me up for that. <laughs> and sign Jerry up too. <laughs> Michael is the author of seven previous books, including Cooked, Food Rules, In Defense of Food, The Omnivore's Dilemma, and The Botany of Desire, all of which have been New York Times bestsellers. Michael will be selling, I'm selling and signing his books in the lobby. <laughs> will you be selling them and signing them? We'll be selling them, he'll be signing them. Paulin teaches writing in the English department at Harvard and at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism, where he has been the John S. and James L. Knight Professor of Journalism since 2003. In 2010, Time Magazine named Paulin one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Wow. <laughs> Must be really hard to be his wife. No. He lives in Berkeley with his wife, Judith, who is here with us tonight, so welcome. We are delighted that Corby Kummer, an expert in his own right, is with us to lead the conversation with Michael. These two have shared the stage before and are friends, so be ready to be delighted. In addition to serving as the editor-in-chief of the Aspen Institute's Ideas magazine, Corby's work in the Atlantic established him as one of the most widely read, authoritative, and creative food writers in the US. The San Francisco Examiner pronounced him a dean among food writers in America. Whoa, Corby. Corby is the recipient of five James Beard Journalism Awards, including the MFK Fisher Distinguished Writing Award. Please join me in welcoming Michael Pollan and Corby Kummer. What, Thank you, Jean. <laughs> what an exciting night to get to be in Pepkit with all of you. Gene and Jerry, it's wonderful of you to have this series and to have Michael, to get Michael to come, something we've been dreaming of for quite a long time. And I'm so glad you mentioned um, the second most special, or I would say first most special person in this room besides Michael, his wife Judith Belzer, a fantastic artist and person in her own right. So if you think he's fantastic, just wait till you meet Judith. Um, I agree with that, by the way. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> I'm very glad Gina mentioned Michael's books. I am simply going to take it for granted that you have all read uh, The Omnivore's Dilemma and In Defense of Food and Food Rules, but I am ordering you to order, if you do not own a copy, The Botany of Desire, um, because if you love those books as you should and as I do, what a treat you have in store reading The Botany of Desire, um, which was uh, the book I'd, I'd read Michael's writing for years, um, but that book just woke me up and said, science writing and technical writing can be done in a new and beautiful way. Thank you, Greg. And that was, um, that was uh, Michael writes better than any of us do. So um, there was, whenever Michael writes something, 
The New Yorker published a piece called The Trip Treatment in 2015. And it seems a long time ago because it was, it was just a life-changing piece. It was long before his book. It was about uh, studying psilocybin at NYU among terminally ill patients, the first seemingly proven and effective treatment to overcome the fear of death. It was an extraordinary article. First of all, because Michael wrote it. Second, because the subject was so new. And I wonder, um, it went to consciousness. It went back to William James. It went back to the Greeks, imminence, materialism. Um, it seemed essential and also seemed like a very shrewd choice of subject for uh, a baby boomer audi book buying audience. Once again, Michael got there first. But it led you down very interesting paths. And I wonder, how did you discover the story? Was it that story that set you to writing a whole book? Why did you decide, this is a book for me? Well, that was the kernel of this book. I mean, often when I'm between, when I finish a book, I don't have like 10 ideas of what I want to write next. I have no idea what I'm going to write next. Um, but So I write some articles. And, uh, and between Cooked and this, I had written like three long articles. One on the microbiome, fascinating topic. Um, but I realized it wasn't ripe for a book, that everything we know about is going to be completely different in five years, and I didn't want to write Even in the past two weeks. Yeah, that's constant right. Studies it's it's, like it's just, you know, subjects have a moment at which they're ripe or about to get ripe. And, and it clearly wasn't true of the microbiome. I wrote a piece on plant intelligence, also for The New Yorker, which was fascinating, but a little um, thin scientifically, shall we say. And... Um, and then I hit on this story, and um, it was, I knew really quickly that there was a book in this. Um, so the story came about, um, well, it, it was interesting you brought up Botany of Desire, because uh, if any book has the sort of sourdough coach, culture that developed into this loaf, it was, um, it was that book. And there's a chapter in there. It's, it, See, he just thought of that himself. <laughs> There is a, uh, so that book is about this, the uh, symbiotic relationship between humans and plants, specifically domesticated plants. And the premise of it is, is that plants manipulate us, even as we think we're manipulating them. And that so the grasses have, you know, persuaded us to take down a lot of trees um, by being valuable to us in various ways. And and because that's their great enemy in, in is is shade, right? And trees. So they come up with different ways to get us, whether it's feeding us with rice and corn, or gratifying our desire for order with lawns. They get us to do the job for them. And um, and so I looked at several different desires that plants evolve to gratify. They get ahead by gratifying our desires. And the weirdest one. I mean, I, and I looked at beauty and nutrition. Um, the weirdest one was the desire to change consciousness which turns out to be a universal human desire. Um, there is only one culture on Earth that doesn't use a plant or a fungus to change consciousness. And that is the Inuit, the Eskimos. And the only reason they don't is nothing good grows where they live. <laughs> as soon as they move to Canada, they get with the program. And, <laughs> and so I've always been curious about this desire. Like, why is it adaptive? It seems like it might not be. Um, and uh, so that's always been in the back of my head. I've had this interest in psychoactive plants. And, um, and then I heard this about this research. I read a piece in the time, New York Times, where most article ideas actually come from. And, um, uh, and, and I was just blown away by the fact that they were giving psilocybin to people who had terminal cancer diagnoses. It seems like if I got a terminal diagnosis, the very last thing I would want to do is trip. And, um, but they were getting these wonderful results. And so I went in and started in interviewing people in this NYU. It was, the, the trials were taking place simultaneously at NYU and at Johns Hopkins. And these were all people who had a cancer diagnosis, many of them terminal, but many of them just paralyzed by fear and uh, anxiety and depression. And you know, in that situation, SSRIs, antidepressants, don't do much for you. And we really have very little to help people in that situation. And, but I started talking to people who were having these uh, transformative experiences that completely reset their attitudes toward their death um, and allowed them to overcome their fear in what 
eventually turned out to be 67% of the cases. Um, so that was, it was my conversations with these people who were astonishing and hearing their stories that convinced me that I, as someone who was almost psychedelically naive, I had had very little experience myself, that I became intensely curious to understand what was going on in their minds and in their brains uh, that a single high-dose psilocybin, guided psilocybin trip would completely change them. Uh, and uh, transformation I'm, is fundamentally what I'm interested in as a writer, whether we're talking about wheat into bread or um, uh, you know, nature into meals or, uh, or human transformation. And the transformation in the piece, you, if you read the, the trip, uh, treatment, which appears very late in the book, actually about yeah, four most of fifths, it's in the book, at the end. in the therapy chapter, but it's also available online, uh, at, you know, for free. Especially this morning, if you don't want to be carrying this, you will have a, a beautiful hard count bound copy by the end of this evening. Um, but uh, it's it's easily available, downloadable when you're walking into town. The transformation was so profound for these terminal cancer patients of feeling they could walk toward the most threatening and most dangerous thing rather than being told to avoid or away. They simply went up, they faced it, they challenged it, they came out feeling in ways that they had licked it and they could be just fine going forward. So profound this transformation. When you go through your own uh, guided experiences and you talk to many of the researchers and tell us a little something about the rich, completely respectable scientific history that there was that's so interesting uh, t to read about if, if you weren't aware of the hundreds of authorized studies that were taking place of LSD and... Well, a so thousand studies before Simon. 1965. Yeah. Um, so go through that, please. But the question is, the transformational experiences of these wonderful, distinguished academics, he's now going to their offices. Um, they're very, you know, well-tenured professors. They have lots of trip experiences in their youth. And they seem to say, it changed my life. It, could, it was course-changing, but I don't need to do it again. I'm not sure exactly what group are you talking about. Because that's the researchers in this work for the most part, do not acknowledge having had psychedelic experience. Then I'm talking about the people you ran into at parties in Berkeley. Okay. <laughs> I just want to be clear. Um, getting, getting the researchers to go on record about their own experiences was very difficult, which I understand because that's how medicine works now. But if you go back pre-1962, doctors routinely, researchers routinely tried drugs on themselves before they gave them to anybody else. It was the ethical thing to do. They didn't want to treat their patients like guinea pigs. So all the, all this, there, there was, as you alluded to, this incredibly rich period of psychedelic research um, through the 50s and into the 60s until you get to Timothy Leary and the counterculture. And that's what kind of stop, that's what stops it. Um, but all those psychiatrists learned a lot by taking LSD and psilocybin themselves. Um, but you can't admit it if indeed it's the case now, I think, uh, without, uh, except at great cost to your reputation. But it is important to draw a distinction between um, what we call uh, recreational use and this kind of more um, therapeutic or guided use. And, and maybe I should just outline what a, what a guided uh, experience is, because it's fundamentally different. Um, and. Um, addresses some of the problems with um, what can be careless use of, of psychedelics um, in many cases. So a guided psychedelic experience is a one where you're attended by a guide who's a therapist uh, too very often if you're, in, if you're in one of these above ground trials. Um, and they're, they're trained therapists, as I said, and they will prepare you for what's about to happen. Many of these people have never tried a psychedelic who are, who are in these trials. And they'll tell you uh, what might happen, what to do if you get into trouble. They give you what they call flight instructions. Um, and so if you get very anxious, if you see something really scary, you're not supposed to try to run away or, or escape it. You're supposed to go toward it. And um, if you feel yourself going crazy or your ego dissolving and yourself falling apart, go with it. Um, surrender. 
you know, trust and let go. These are the kind of mantras they give you. And this is very important to avoiding the so-called bad trip. Uh, which is often the anxiety that comes from trying to fight what's going on in your mind, and resistance is pretty much futile. Um, and uh, so that preparation is really important. I found it very, very important. Um, and then they also ask you to set an intention. Uh, if you're trying to address, say, your fear of dying or your smoking addiction or whatever, whatever it is that you're trying to deal with, um, so they have you set an intention. It doesn't always turn out to be at the center of the trip, but very often it will, that you end up dealing with those issues. Um, and they're, they're with you during the whole time. You're wearing eye shades, which to people who have a lot of experience with psychedelics seems all wrong. You know, you want to go out in the Aspen Groves and... Yeah, but the idea here is to have a very internal trip. So you wear eye shades, which turn out to be the, this incredibly powerful technology. It, it I mean, you, I mean... If any of you have per perhaps had experience with psychedelics, you know the I difference. I admit it to you. <laughs> well, I've come clean. Um, the difference between having your eyes open and closed is night and day. Um, uh, so anyway, so you're wearing eye shades and you're listening to music, a very carefully curated playlist. It doesn't have, uh, it, it's mostly instrumentals and it kind of supports and underscores the arc of the, of the journey and, and cancels out a lot of distractions. Um, so they're with you the whole time, they'll hold your hand if you get into trouble, you get upset, they'll walk you to the bathroom, they'll give you some grapes if you get hungry. Um, and then after the experience, which on psilocybin, uh, which is what most of the research uses, not LSD, for reasons we can talk about, um, uh, it lasts about six hours, and, um, and then you come back the next day for what is called an integration session. And that's essentially where a, a good therapist helps you make sense of what happened. Um, and uh, you tell the story of your trip, and they try to help you find things in it, nuggets that you can use, uh, moments of insight, epiphanies, that you can use to illuminate your life and, and, and apply to the conduct of your life. So this is a very different kind of experience than I think most people have had. And it does seem like... Um Short order psychotherapy, even though I'm sure psychotherapists would just it would would hate that whole idea, but it seems like you achieve results in a much more efficient way and a sudden way. You didn't really experience a bad trip, though. You experienced some initial fear in one of the one of the trips. Well, I guess one. I had so I had five or six guided psychedelic trips for this book. Um, uh, on psilocybin, on LSD, uh, on DMT, which is the ingredient in ayahuasca, and um, a very obscure psychedelic called 5-MeO-DMT, which is the smoked venom of the Sonoran Desert Toad. <laughs> I know. That it? I mean, how about a species that can figure that one out, huh? <laughs> Give ourselves a hand. Um, <laughs> And that was the, that was the most, uh, I would call that a bad trip, I think. Um, it's, it's not something I ever want to do again. Um, it's such a, a sudden and violent uh, experience of, um, I mean, it all, it just, you, you take a single puff uh, on this, on this pipe where this um, venom is being, it's, it's crystallized. N n no uh, toads are harmed in the making of this drug, by the way. <laughs> Just so you know. Um, They're petted. <laughs> you, you know, you gently squeeze these glands on the sides of these toads and, and on, onto a sheet of glass, and overnight it, it, um, uh, it crystallizes, and it looks like brown sugar, and then you burn that, or, or your guide burns that. And... Um, I was very nervous about doing this. I was very nervous before every single one of these experiences. I had a sleepless night uh, of arguing with myself about, is this crazy? You know, you're a 60-year-old man. You're going to go up on this mountain with this guy you barely know, and uh, there's no um, telephone service. And, uh, you know, if, if something goes wrong, is this guy really going to call 911? You know? Um, so playing off these narratives to myself, and then the other side saying, well, you know, you could learn something really interesting about your mind, and you have a book to write. And, um, <laughs> and in every case, finally, I was able to embark on the journey. Um, and I realized subsequently that that voice of caution was my ego 
trying to protect itself from what was about to be an assault on it. Um, and our egos are very clever and they command our rational faculties, um, but they're not always to be listened to. Um, so anyway, do you want to hear about the DMT trip? Yes. Or, yeah. So <laughs> I find if I give an audience a choice between hearing about a good trip or a bad trip, <laughs> they always want to hear about the bad trip. Um, <laughs> Okay, we'll get to the good trip. Um, so you take a, a, a single puff on this, and before you even lie down, um, you are just shot out of a cannon, and you experience, um, you have nothing to orient yourself. It's very hard to write about this, because not only is your sense of self completely blasted to smithereens, um, but your sense of time is, too, and your sense of place. And you felt. I have to interrupt you and tell the whole audience who is going to memorize and buy this book tonight <laughs> the extraordinary recall you have of these trips. It's one thing to take notes when you're going through something. I cannot imagine how you took such detailed notes of things that are beyond our reckoning and in your case were very unpleasant and yet you evoke them as well as the good things, don't worry, good things, extremely specifically. How do you do that? Well, I didn't take notes during and I, I do know people who've done that but I just could not. I couldn't think about it. And um, but one of the things that's really striking is that um, this is not like dreams. I mean, you know, dreams. You know, you feel that undertow pulling your dream out of your memory, like as soon as you have it, as soon as you wake up. Here, it's indelible. I mean, the um, the authority of the experience. Uh, William James called it the, the noetic sense. Uh, this sense that what you've perceived. It has this objective truth um, that, and it's it, it's unshakable. And and I know I've talked to people who haven't tripped in 30 years, and they will tell me in in sometimes excruciating detail about everything that happened. So it's a, it's a quality of the drugs um, that you can remember things. And um, uh, so what I would do after an experience is that night. Um, write an extensive diary of everything that happened. And then when you have your integration session the next day, you're telling the story. And there's a process by which what is a little bit inco inchoate or very inchoate resolves itself into narrative through telling the story. Um, and, and, and there's some editing that goes on in that process. So you were able to go home and then, based on your integrative session, revise well, and shape your notes? Well, uh, the first session would be right after, before I had my integration, write down everything I could, and it would be like a, I don't know, 15-page single-spaced account. I wow. mean, it was very detailed. Everything I could remember. And then the next day I would tell the story and then I'd, I'd, I'd write more and it would gradually get more resolved. But the first person who helped me integrate was Judith. Um, you know, er, after every one of these events, we would sit down and have dinner and I would tell the story and it was enormously helpful. Um, and she would remind me that, oh, this connected to that in your life or um, uh, maybe this is what this means and, you know, help, help me begin to interpret. But the... Frog, the toad experience was, uh, it had no narrative to it. it. It just was, I felt like I was in this category five mental hurricane. And just, but there was no boundary. My skull and the world were all in this chaos. And it was a terrifying, it was really it was your terrifying. first, wasn't it? What? It was the first guided trip? No, it, thank God it wasn't. I never would have had another. Um, I wouldn't have gotten the book written. Um, it's the third one in, in, the, uh, in the section, the travelogue section. And, um, the, but the best thing about it, so I'm just in this swirl of energy and there's no matter, there's no time, there's no self. And I don't know who's perceiving this exactly, um, but something's perceiving it. And, but the best thing about it is it only lasts 20 minutes. Um, so very soon after, um, you start coming down. And I remember putting my hands on my thighs. I, I have a light blanket over me, and I'm lying down on a cushion. And I was like, oh, I have a body. And then I put my hands on the ground. It's like, matter. There is matter. And then time, because I realized a little time had gone by since I touched the ground. And... Um, and I, this terror was succeeded by, and this is why I'm not sure it's a bad trip, by this profound sense of gratitude. 
Um, not only that I was alive, we've all expressed gratitude for being alive, I think. I, I felt gratitude for the fact there is anything. <laughs> <laughs> that there is something rather than nothing. Because I had had a taste of what nothing might be like. And, and yet in a later trip, and they are pleasant, but he's just given you the only bad experience he personally describes. You describe seeing something that looks like it's steel beams, it's a rectangular superstructure over a loamy earth, a rich earth, and you realize it is your ego, it's reminiscent of the erector sets of your childhood, and when it floats away, you're perfectly fine with that, and you think, you, you don't think, oh, I've gotten rid of some horrible, heavy appendage I never wanted. You think that's fine, too. Um, you're able to make sense of these in very useful, helpful ways that seem interesting to your personality. Can you imagine, since the guiding experience is so essential, have you, did you stop to imagine what would this have been like if I hadn't had the integrative session? You know, I think the value of the guided experience, and I should say, we haven't mentioned this, that I, I did not participate in any of these above ground trials at NYU and Johns Hopkins. This is, in my case, I had to find what are called underground guides. And I learned in part of my research that there is a, uh, a fairly large community of therapists who use psychedelics um, at great personal risk. And um, so that's who I was working with. Um, and I found my way into this community, both on the West Coast and the East Coast. And, um, uh, but I think many people have had powerful psychedelic trips that they, went, especially when they were kids and teenagers, where their friends, when they said, oh, I saw God, or I had this transformative experience, their friends just said, oh, you had too many mushrooms, you know. And a lot of people have put this experience in a box labeled weird drug experience. And, and um, but when you do it with the guide, there's a premise that it does mean something, and it's worth thinking about. Um, and indeed, that what happens to you is, it's not a product of the molecule you've taken. I mean, LSD or psilocybin doesn't have, imply any imagery of erector sets floating over the, the earth. Uh, it's you. I mean, you've, act, you've, you've activated something in your mind. You've released something. It's, it's you know, it may be, maybe it's your subconscious or or unconscious, or, uh, I mean, depending on your theory of where, you know, things come from in your mind. Um, so I, I think that when you start from that premise that this is your mind telling you something um, or revealing something to you, then you're in intensely curious to try to figure out what it is. And yet you have this, uh, I guess, saying, it's a truism, you may not get the trip you want, but you get the trip you need. So you may go in with an agenda in this guided session um, to overcome a certain fear, or we should talk about addiction therapy, because those are ongoing trials. But it, it might not necessarily end that way. In retrospect, do you think that you did get the trips you needed, and can you imagine having a, an understanding task at hand that you would wish to engage in another guided trip to, to understand? Yeah. Um, I, I could see, you know, I'm kind of done with this part of my life of having these experiences, I think, at least for now, and I have to be very careful right now, but let's say that this were permitted and that um, in the next five years, there's a fairly good chance that psilocybin and MDMA or ecstasy will be approved as medicines. I know that's kind of an outrageous prediction, but um, we're closer than you might realize to this happening uh, for reasons we can, we can discuss. Um, if it were legal, um, I could easily imagine doing this, having one of these experiences every year on my birthday. Um, just as a really useful stock taking, you know, where, where am I in life? What am I struggling with? Um, my dad just died in January and if I were having a trip now, I think, a, you know, a lot of it would be about that and, and that would perhaps be my intention to somehow make further contact with him. Um, uh, so... You know, you, you talk about um, therapy on steroids or, you know, fast forwarded. And, and, I, and you hear that from a lot of people, that this experience was like five years of therapy crammed into an afternoon. 
And there is some truth to that. Um, it basically breaks through any boundaries you have, um, any, any defenses you have. Um, when you have a high dose ego dissolving psilocybin experience, everything that you have trouble talking to your therapist about is just blasted. Uh, it's just, so people open up very, you know, very quickly. And, and uh, on MDMA, which is not a drug I deal with at great length in the book, which is being used to treat trauma uh, with, with su amazing success, actually, post-traumatic stress, um, the, uh, the bond that's created between the, the patient and the therapist is instantaneous. And, and the level of trust, because these, this drug leads to a flood of oxytocin in your system, which is a, you know, the bonding hormone. Um, so there is a sense in which they do speed up therapy for some people, and probably not for everybody. You remind me of something that my own late father, a GP, would say. He had these wonderful maxims. And it was, when we were worried, would we be able to cope with uh, the death of a dear relative or something? He would say, you know, the mind won't go beyond what you're able to handle. So don't, you just don't have to worry about that because however traumatic you think something is going to be, you'll be able to handle it. But in this kind of explosion of consciousness that dismantles like your, your third trip, does does psilocybin go beyond what you think you're able to handle? You're very well defended, you're a very well integrated person, so you were able to handle it. Did you hear stories of people not being able to cope? Yeah, there are people who have experiences that they're not ready for. And there are a couple, um, that sometimes that involves a childhood trauma. Um, a childhood trauma that someone perhaps has buried and isn't aware of, is only dimly aware of, will sometimes surface. And that can be incredibly destabilizing. It can be the beginning, though, of a, a very positive therapeutic process. Um, but I, did, I didn't meet some people who had had that experience. Although one person I, I met who was healed by it, um, who had had a, um, a, a, a fatal, or in 75% of cases, fatal autoimmune disease, she was bedridden, could no longer walk. It's, I forget the name of the scleroderma is the name of the disease, where your uh, your cartilage or uh, connective tissue gets harder and harder until you're frozen. And she already she could not walk. She was bedridden through a long set of in, in desperation. She'd reached out to a, a, an institute that gives people ayahuasca in Peru, and by the time she was approved for a, a scholarship, she was um, uh, she couldn't get there anymore, she couldn't travel. So they very kindly sent it to her and with her caregiver she had a series of, of ayahuasca experiences in which she, she had been adopted, uh, she's Korean, and she'd been adopted by Americans in Arkansas. And she got in touch with the fact that her father had raped her repeatedly when she was quite young. And um, having gone through that experience though, which was incredibly painful, she had a series of these trips, and over time, um, she was released from this. Um, and that autoimmune disease, some people believe, is, is the self attacking the self, sometimes because of guilt and shame. And that she had taken on the shame for this episode and was attacking her body. Uh, that's at least how she understood it. But she walks now. She's fine. <laughs> I mean, I know, it's, a, it's an incredible story. and. Um, uh, so, and it wasn't the, it was it, 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 she wasn't cured by ayahuasca. I don't want to suggest someone was cured by ayahuasca, but she was she surfaced a memory that by dealing with that memory cured her. Can, can we talk? That's quite a striking story, and you tell it. Um, can we talk about less lord-like cures? Um, because you're very high on legalization not because you think it's wonderful recreational, because you've seen the uses, the potential utility. And I, could you talk about utility in, in addiction, for example, and beyond uh, recreational use? Is it, is it fear of death and addiction? What else? So I, I want to clarify. I, I'm not sure that I favor legalization, uh, but I, I do Why in the sense that... No, in, not in the sense that we've legalized uh, cannabis in this state, in my state. Um, which is to say anybody over 18 can have access to it. I do support research leading to FDA approval 
of the drugs. So that's a slightly different thing. I mean, it's a form of legalization. But I think they need to be very tightly regulated. I think that there's, uh, I think that people need to work with licensed guides. Um, I think that would be the best way to, to bring it to the public. Um, I do think there's a place in the lives of people who aren't mentally ill that can benefit from these drugs, so we have to figure out how to do that. Um, but straight up legalization, I'm, I'm not sure that's the best idea. Um, in terms of the applications, um, there have been tr trials uh, using psilocybin uh, for several different indications. One is uh, fear and anxiety of people with cancer diagnoses. Um, and phase two trials have been completed and they were very successful there. They've been used in pilot studies to deal with alcohol addiction and smoking addiction. The smoking study was kind of incredible. It was a small sample, it's like 20 people. This was done at Johns Hopkins. Uh, these are, you know, smoking is one of the hardest addictions to break. Um, and they achieved, uh, let's see, a 60 plus percent abstention rate after a year, uh, six months or a year. The, the standard that we have, the drug that we have that we treat smoking addiction with has a 20% success rate, so really dramatic. Now, we, we have to see if this can be duplicated in larger studies. So how did that work? Um, you know, I, I, I found that really implausible. Why should one drug help with addiction to another drug? Um, what appears to happen, and I interviewed a lot of the people in the smoking studies who, who told me these kind of crazy stories. They were very different than the cancer studies. I remember talking to this one woman She's an Irish woman, she's about 60. I don't think she'd ever used psychedelics and she had a high dose experience to deal with smoking. She said she, uh, she described an experience in which she grew wings that allowed her to fly all through European history. She, she witnessed these incredible scenes of European history. She saw her, her uh, she died three times uh, and she saw her uh, body rise from the Ganges, from a funeral pyre on the Ganges. And she, was, she witnessed the birth of creation. She's telling me this incredible travelogue. And then she said, and after all that, it just seems stupid to kill yourself with cigarettes. <laughs> there, were, <laughs> there were so many amazing things to do and see in this world. Now, I'm sure she had been told or thought herself that smoking was stupid before that happened, but it, she didn't believe it in the way she now believed it. And this goes back to that noetic quality that I was mentioning. The, that these insights or epiphanies have the force of revealed truth. And I heard from one smoker after another, like, I realize my breath is precious. Um, why would I be want to kill myself? These are some of the starkly banal revelations yes. you called them. I couldn't believe how banal these were compared to the NYU transcendence. Yeah, and well, people dealing with death have more profound um, realizations without question. But... Um, there's a fine line, though, between banality and profundity. I mean, that's one of the things I learned in my own experiences. And, you know, I had this one experience uh, on LSD, and I was trying to describe it. And, and writing about these experiences was probably the, the, the sternest literary challenge I, I've ever faced. Um, and I had these... Uh, it was a weird experience. It wasn't what I expected LSD to be like at all. It was a very kind of psychological experience where... You know, I just thought about people in my life. I thought about my wife and my son and my sisters and my parents. And, and I felt this, like, incredible, um, this channel of love had opened up. And um, that's a very embarrassing thing to write down. And, you know, it's, and I sound like a Hallmark card talking about this. But then I realized, well, you know, Actually, you know, and, 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 and I had this thought as this experience was happening, this is not uncommon on psychedelics, that the most important thing in the world is love. That's a banality, but it's also profoundly true. And, um, and, and psychedelics takes you right to that edge. And it comes up again and again. It's the overwhelming force. The fact of discovering that helps people not fear death anymore. It can overcome any challenge. Um, and what it is, I think, is the um, putting down of defenses. I think, I think if the drugs do one thing, it's they soften the ego structures or, or, um, or obliterate them in some cases. And it is our ego that keeps us from feeling things, that, that you know, wreathes us in irony and the feeling of been there, done that, and, and the familiarity of, you know, our brains are tuned for novelty. 
right? I mean, which makes very good sense from an evolutionary point of view. There are new threats in the environment. You have to observe changes in your environment. But we downplay the familiar, which is often the most important things, uh, such as love for people in our family. And, um, and psychedelics revalues that. And the familiar suddenly becomes something really rich that you want to explore. And um, especially, again, when you have the eye shades. If you don't have the eye shades, you're going to gravitate to novelty. Uh, when I ask this question, it is a way of having you all prepare your questions because we're about to move to Q&A. There will be runners who will bring the mic to you. So this is the question. Uh, to me, and probably to many readers, it will be very striking that research was going gangbusters in this. It was, um, was LSD synthesized in 1938. Yeah. And it was being used for everything regularly for alcoholism, no, and for yeah. schizophrenia. And this was going to be the miracle drug. There was all kinds of uh, scientific ferment happening, great excitement, and then wham, clamped down, uh, mostly over Vietnam, counterculture, fears of insurgency. Um, and, and did you find yourself wondering, what if that hadn't happened? Where would we be now? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so this was all news to me. I mean, for me, psychedelics shows up in the 60s. It's a product of the 60s. The word psychedelic is a 60s word. Actually, it's not. It's a 50s word coined by an English psychiatrist working in Saskatchewan to describe these drugs. And it simply means mind manifesting. Um, there were many people, even establishment people in psychiatry, who thought LSD um, was um, a game changer. In, uh, and in fact, the study of LSD opens up a whole branch of brain science. We really didn't understand neurotransmitter networks uh, or the fact that we had these neurotransmitters in the early 50s when this research really gets uh, underway. But the fact that LSD could have such profound effects on the brain in such tiny doses measured in micrograms was an indication that there was a receptor network and they went looking for it and found it. And um, and, and the serotonin receptors are the same ones implicated in the, in the classic psychedelics. So, yeah, we lost about 30 years. The research is shut down uh, after the 60s. It, it dribbles on into the 70s for a few years, and then it stops. And um, given what we're learning now, I think we could have saved a lot of suffering. Um, uh, I think that we have here potentially a powerful new tool um, for psychiatry and for mental health care. And one of the things I didn't realize when I started out um, was how broken mental health care is in this country and how, how much suffering there is, um, uh, that rates of depression are rising worldwide. Depression is now the leading cause of disability around the world. Suicide rates are, are climbing. Addiction, we know w what a serious problem that has become. And we have very few tools. If you compare mental health care to any other branch of medicine, whether you're talking about oncology or cardiology or infectious disease, all of which have diminished suffering, lengthened lifespans, you can't say that about mental health care. We're not moving forward. Uh, and the last innovation was the SSRIs in the late 80s and early 90s, the antidepressants, uh, which don't work for very long when they do work, and people don't like taking them. They have trouble getting off them. Um, so there is a, there's a desperate need for new tools. And along comes the renaissance of this research, um, which many of the researchers I talk to really believe could be a revolution in mental health care. Um, and for not for schizophrenia, although that was experimented with in the 50s, but for a series of mental illnesses that, are, that share certain characteristics. One is um, excessive rigidity. The rigidity of the addict who's stuck in grooves of behavior and thought, that's very similar to the rigidity of the, depress de the depressive who's um, stuck in stories, you know, of um, lack of self-worth, not, not worthy of love, um, and uh, people who are obsessives of one kind or another. My guess is eating disorders, which will be trialed soon, will yield to this. Um, as one researcher put it, the psychedelics have the power to shake the snow globe uh, of your mind and re, um, essentially break patterns, um, patterns that are being reinforced by certain structures in your mind um, that can get uh, overactive, many of which are linked to your ego. 
Um, and uh, so we have, we have something potentially very powerful here. Um, the research, none of which is being paid for by the federal government. It's just too controversial. They're working with psilocybin because that's less controversial than LSD. It's not necessarily more effective. Didn't one study sneak in under the National Institute of Mental Health wire and somehow it's chugged along below the radar? Well, some of the labs have money, and even from NIDA. Uh, so some well, of the people are on, on NIDA funds. But I don't know that NIDA knows that. Um, uh, don't tell. Um, so it's all been private money. Um, and yet enough private money has been raised that we will get phase three trials, which is the last step of using psilocybin for depression um, and, uh, and to treat the dying, which is very exciting. So the FDA has been remarkably encouraging of this work. Um, I think they understand the need for new tools. And, um, and that's why I think that in five years or so, we may find that uh, these amazing substances will be approved. Questions? Gentlemen, first with a hand up. Thank you. This was a really fascinating conversation, and I'm a big fan of your books. Thank you. And um, you started by saying you entered this story because it was right, but it's a very different moment than the story of food, where agribusiness and the food industry have come in Yeah. Excellent question. Um, you know, I spent a little time at the end of the book trying to play out some scenarios of how these um, medicines might enter our culture. Uh, and they're going to be very hard to fit in to either what big pharma does and knows how to do and likes to do, which is sell you a pill you have to take every day for the rest of your life. Right? This, these are, you're going to only have to have one, two, or three of these experiences. So three pills is not something they're going to invest in uh, per person. And um, uh, plus, there's no IP. The intellectual property, psilocybin, is in a mushroom that grows around here. And LSD is off patent. And MDMA is off patent. So how are they going to have that level of control? There'll be instantly generic drugs. Um, and that's why Big Pharma is not investing. Uh, they're watching it closely. Um, I, you know, I did a couple interviews that suggest that their strategy is as soon as a small company figures out how to do this, and there is at least one small company working on that, they will just swoop in and buy it. That's how they innovate these days, which is actually the same as the food industry. No real innovation on the part of the big companies. They just purchase startups. Um, but... You know, psychotherapists, too, are going to have trouble with this business model where, you know, you're not going to come back every week for years. And um, so it's a challenge all around. There's a, there's a company in England called Compass Pathways that is um, uh, conducting trials beginning this summer of psilocybin in treatment-resistant depression, working with uh, eight different sites around Europe. And their plan is to offer a package of training for guides and therapists, um, uh, a room, the design of the room, we didn't talk about that, but the setting is very important too, and integration, uh, and that they're gonna offer this package to behavioral health clinics, national health services, and they're convinced that that package will be cheaper, even though it involves a, you know, a lot of hours of therapy over a very short amount of time, that they can devise a package that will um, be more effective in treating treatment-resistant depression, which by definition, nothing is working for. Um, and uh, and that, that will, that, you know, they've got an idea for a business model. We'll see. But it's, it's going to be a challenge. Um, and, uh, but a good challenge. I mean, you know, there's, the system we have isn't working. <laughs> so thanks for your question. That's a very, very good question. Ah, uh, Ms. Saban. Hi. So, as someone who likes good stories, I was curious if you could tell us a little bit more about your good trip. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, the best trip I had and the most transformative one was on a, it was a guided psilocybin trip with a guide I call Mary in the book. And um, 
it was a high dose. I was trying to, I was trying to simulate the dose in the above ground trials, uh, like roughly 25 milligrams of, of, of synthesized psilocybin or four or five grams of dry mushroom. And it was a, a powerful trip. It wasn't all positive. Um, I had a period, uh, the music shapes your experience in powerful ways, and um, the underground guides have really shitty taste in music. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I shouldn't generalize like that, but it was this... And they're banal. Yeah, yeah, banal, yeah. And so it's this, it's kind of like spa music. It's, it would be fine if you were getting a really good massage, but you're exploring your, like, inner resources, and it's not what you want to hear. But how about the heavy metal that made you think <laughs> no, it, just of metal? <laughs> so Thierry David, uh, was, they were playing, and this, and, the, and it was so insipid, and it was, and I thought it was electronica. It turns out it wasn't. Long story behind that, but um, and it was generating this 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 video game dystopian video game environment that I was going through with these black stalactites and stalagmites, like you might see in a recording studio of foam, you know, like looks like that. And eighties uh, disco, yeah, eighties disco, and I was trapped in it, and I, I really wanted to get out, and I asked my guide to change the music, and anyway, at a certain point, I got up. Uh, I had to, uh, it was getting kind of intense, and I realized this, I could really get panicky about this. I'm trapped in a world I don't like. And I, so I took off my eye shades, and it was the most amazing thing I saw. The, everything in this room was just jeweled with light, and every beam of light was coming right to me. And uh, I got myself with her, Mary's help, to the, uh, to the bathroom, and didn't dare look in the mirror. And I, I told this story to a group of people who are in a psychedelic society in San Francisco, and they were like, oh, yeah, trip face. You don't want to go there. <laughs> I've never heard that expression, trip face. So, <laughs> um, uh, so I didn't look there. And uh, as I say in the book, I produced this spectacular crop of diamonds. Uh, and then... Um, Came back and lie down and oh and and I and I, Mary asked would I like a, a booster dose to get up to the four or five that we'd agreed on, and I said yes. And this really weird thing happened to Mary. I looked at her and she was squatting next to me on this cushion where I was, and she had she she had long blonde hair parted in the center, and she had been transformed into a Mexican Indian with black hair, leathery brown skin, high cheekbones. And I, I knew exactly who she was. She was Maria Sabina, who was this Mexican curandera who gave the first Westerner a psilocybin trip in 1955. And I didn't think I should tell her what had happened to her. And um, so I, I took the additional dose. And then I experienced something I'd never experienced before, which was um, uh, my sense of self, just kind of, um, this is before the toad, uh, experience, but it was like I had become this little cloud of post-its, um, just these little yellow pieces of paper. And but I, but I had no desire to pull it all back together and reconstitute myself. And and then there was this other perspective, and like who who was perceiving this dissolution of who I was? And that's a paradox that I, I still can't understand. But um, and then I looked out again, and I had turned into this coat of paint. And I was just painted over the landscape, and that was me, and I was fine with it. And this other perspective, which was incredibly calm, um, uninvested in what was happening, was fine with whatever there was. I don't know what this is, but it's what I think Huxley in, in Doors of Perception talked about the mind at large, this, this kind of more universal consciousness that you feel like you can borrow or have access to. And, um, and then there was myself, and, and it was no more. And I, was, I had this other perspective. So I didn't know what to make of this, and I went back for my integration the next day. And, um, and I stayed in this dissolved ego situation. I had this amazing experience, finally, with a great piece of music. I got Mary to put on a Bach unaccompanied cello concerto, and a suite, and I, I merged with the instrument. I merged with the music. I was absolutely one with Yo-Yo Ma's bow, which was just kind of rubbing over me. It was, it was incredible. And, uh, <laughs> um, and I said to her, um, so I'd had this, I told her about this experience. And I said, okay, so I, I ha what was significant was I had, ex I had an experience of being in the world without an ego. And it was okay. And she said, well, that's, don't you think that's worth the price of admission? 
And I said, yeah, but my ego is back in patrol and in uniform again, and so what good is that? And she said, well, now that you've had a taste of that perspective, you can cultivate it. And I asked her how, and she said, through meditation. And meditation is, is often the, the best way to apply the kind of thinking mode of consciousness that you, that you taste on a psychedelic experience. And a lot of Buddhist, American Buddhists began with psychedelics and ended up with meditation. So that's what I've been trying to do. But it gave me a, a distance on my ego um, that was incredibly valuable. And I realized that with my ego came these defenses that got in the way of openness and emotion and I don't want to go all the way down that path but are you making this meditation which you talk about in the book as I mean not like a booster shot but as a way of continuing into the everyday it's a way realm of, yes it's a way of applying what I learned but it's also a way of reconnecting with it you know I had a powerful experience that was quite beautiful and it was one of the most transformative experiences I think I've had in my life but it's 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 I don't want it to fade away and and through meditation, I can I can grab hold of it. Not not every time, uh, not do reliably. You, do you find that the meditation is uh, something you need to practice on a regular basis, or are you able to summon it through meditation no, at I, will? I, I, it's like a muscle. You do need to practice it. So I do meditate uh, every morning and uh, almost every morning. Um, and I need to get more serious about it. I mean, one of the things that's come out of this book for me is to go on a meditation retreat and get definitely get more serious about it. One of the interesting things um, uh, that I learned is we didn't really, we don't have time to go into the neuroscience of everything I've been describing, which is a big part of the book. Um, but when they began scanning the brains of people on psilocybin, they would give you psilocybin and slide you into an fMRI machine, which is a horrible thing to contemplate. Um, <laughs> but we have to thank these brave volunteers for doing it. Um, their brains, the same parts of their brains were deactivated that are deactivated in the minds of very experienced meditators. Uh, something called the default mode network that's very involved, the, implicated in the generation of the sense or illusion of a self. Um, and uh, so there are, there, there's a real, there's a, there's a neurobiological kinship between meditation and psychedelic, uh, the psychedelic trip. And there's a scene where you have 22 or something electrodes attached to your brain yeah. and you have your own deactivation moment because you have a very pleasant and interesting experience that with your uncanny ability you can recall and write about. I still can't believe that. And evidently the researcher on the other side of the wall says, what in the world were you thinking? There was like no stimulation coming. Well, th this is a, a meditation researcher, a neuroscientist named Judson Brewer, um, who's got a terrific book out called The Craving Mind. It's about addiction and the default mode network. And um, uh, he has created a, a kind of neural feedback machine where you put on this bathing cap that has 128 electrodes, and they're all focused on one particular node of the default mode network called the posterior cingulate cortex, which is involved in where you tell stories to yourself about who you are, and you take information from experience and you um, tie it in. So, so if I showed you a, a list of adjectives, um, you know, cheap, handsome, courageous, uh, you know, depressed, whatever, and just ask you to look at them on a screen, nothing would happen in the posterior cingulate cortex. It wouldn't light up. But if I said, think about how these adjectives either apply to you or don't, you would start making little stories, and it would light up. So it's the kind of enough about you part of your brain, right? I mean, it's very self-obsessed. And, um, and so he has this machine where you can, you, with various exercises, either increase or decrease the activity in it. And as an experiment, I thought, I, I told him, he was giving me various, you know, try meditating, do a loving kindness meditation, and that lowered the, you know, lowered the activity, uh, things to get you off yourself. And I tried something without telling him, which is just recollecting one of my uh, trips, uh, one of my ego dissolving trips. And just remembering it drove down the activity dramatically in this, in this particular part of the brain. So that's, you know, uh, Memory is very powerful. You, you, you activate the exact same parts of your brain that are active when you're actually having the experience. Um, so that's a, that's a powerful resource for healing that we don't do very much with. 
And we can all, we're out of time. And so we can think about trying to apply all those lessons. Read this, I'm going to learn how to meditate. If you were not dazzled and impressed by Michael Pollan coming in, you certainly have been this evening. Thank you Thank very you, Corby. much. Thank you, Corby. Thank you so much. Thank you for your great questions. Thank you.